Welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. We'll give it a couple of minutes, uh, see if anybody else joins us, and then we'll get started. Thanks. Okay, we'll get started a while. Uh, I get you out of here at a decent time since it's, it's getting late in the day here. Uh, good afternoon. I want to welcome you to our uh, session on Can You Talk? Uh, Communications Coordination and Cooperation for Increased Roadway Safety. I'm Todd Lee. I'm the Traffic Incident Management Coordinator for the Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission. And with me is my uh, able body assistant, Dave Wolf from Drive Engineering. Uh, he also works uh, with me uh, as our part of our pen time. Uh, initiatives and, and at the PA Turnpike. So what we wanted to try to do or what I wanted to try to do here is to give you a little bit of background of what an emergency responder faces out on the roadway today. Uh, take you out of that engineering mindset and start thinking about uh, an operations mindset uh, to give you a little bit more information uh, on, on what the dangers that we face. So uh, please answer, put any questions, comments, uh, concerns into the chat box as we go through here. Uh, and uh, we'll take some time to answer questions as well. So uh, every day on the roadway, there you know, 6.7 million uh, police reported crashes, eight responders at each incident, that's 53 million targets on the roadway. So if you've ever stood out on the roadway, even doing some field views uh, as, as an engineering or consultant, you know traffic is whizzing by you at, at a high rate of speed. Uh, anytime you're on the highway, even if you're not an emergency scene, even if you stop for something alongside the roadway, uh, you're in danger, you're facing danger. Um, this is what happens on a daily basis out there. Two emergency responders are struck uh, every day in this country. Okay, they're not necessarily killed, uh, but they're struck every day in this country. And uh, every two days, a responder is injured. And about every seven or eight days, a responder is killed. We have 46 emergency responders that have been killed so far this year. Uh, in this country, in the United States. Uh, we need to change that. And the reason why they're getting killed is one, people aren't moving over and slowing down, but two, the drivers. And all of us have probably done uh, at least some of these things uh, and, and we may still do some of these things. Uh, hopefully not driving drunk, but drugged. It, it doesn't have to be uh, illegal drugs. What about the cold and flu medicine? What about the allergy medicine? Drowsy, you know, we drive drowsy, we work long hours to drive drowsy. Distracted could be distracted, not necessarily texting and driving, but if you're driving down the roadway on your on your phone, even if it's a, a hands-free phone, uh, am I still distracted? Is my mind in the game? Am I looking out the windshield? How about deliberately bad? You know, there's people that drive deliberately. They drive aggressive. Uh, dangerous or just plain dumb? Here's some other ones. Disgruntled drivers. You know, angry drivers out there developing the younger drivers or distinguish the older drivers. And driverless vehicles, we all know driverless vehicles are out there and the uh, driverless and autonomous vehicles and automated vehicles have the potential to save lives in the future. Uh, but what's going on with them now uh, when they're out there? You know, we have level two vehicles, uh, Teslas, we have level three, and level four automated vehicles. And again, I think that technology is there, uh, has the potential to be there, but is it there yet? So let's look at this during the pandemic, um, what happens here? You know, even with traffic volumes down 40 to 60%, we still had emergency responders getting struck on the roadway. 
these are two, two state troopers that that escaped very serious injury uh, when their vehicle was struck on 81 South. Uh, these firefighters were out with a uh, intoxicated driver on a Sunday afternoon, and, and uh, a second intoxicated driver came and hit their fire apparatus. This year in 2020, we had two emergency responders struck and killed. Matt Smelzer was killed on Interstate 70 on July 5th. Uh, Tyler Lodensleger was killed uh, on, I'm sorry, Matt was killed in, in January 5th and Tyler was killed July 21st on Interstate 78. So what we're trying to work on here is this, communications, coordination and cooperation, making sure that we uh, work together to solve problems. And when I say work together, we need you as traffic engineers and traffic professionals, uh, transportation professionals also uh, to be helping out with this because it's not just an emergency responder problem. Uh, we need your help as well. Um, training, could do some increased situational awareness training. Meet with the responders. If you're doing a project, you know, try to meet with the responders. If you're doing something and it affects the emergency responders or the local community, try to set up a meeting with them. If you're doing the transportation management plans, it's a great idea to always uh, invite them to the meetings and, and get their input uh, for these and look to develop some joint SOPs and SOGs. Uh, Dave, I'm gonna have Dave talk a little bit about the training that we do, uh, the learning that Dave developed this training. So it's, it's great training and, and it's free and available for all of you to take today. Yeah, th thanks, Todd, appreciate it. Uh, and again, if anybody has questions, uh, please use the Q&A function, Todd. I don't see a chat box per se with this particular presentation, but um, we do have the Q&A. So if anybody has a question, please put it in there. We'll make sure that we get it in the queue and we'll get it answered in turn. Uh, so anyway, regarding the e-learning, yeah, we rolled this out in the first quarter of, of 2019. Uh, it was deployed on the Train PA platform, which is administered by the Pennsylvania Department of Health. It is also on the Pennsylvania Virtual Training Network, which is dedicated to municipal law enforcement. Uh, administered by the state police, but it is for municipal law enforcement officials. And uh, we were happy to roll this out uh, in an e-learning environment. Um, I, I hesitate to say it might've been a little bit prescient because of course we ended up in a pandemic in the first quarter of 2021. So uh, online learning came even more to the forefront, but uh, it is offered um, through both of those platforms and it is mobile friendly. And what you're looking at there on the screen is basically just a look at the one sheet that we put together through this, uh, the training was developed through a cooperative effort of the Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission, uh, PennDOT, Pima, uh, PennTime. Uh, so we were happy to, to get that out there. And it's been quite successful uh, to date, Todd. I don't know if your next slide has any of the uh, statistics on that. I'm not sure that it does, but yeah, there we go. So uh, this is, um, this is actually total trainings uh, across the entire nation. So Todd, if you want, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. But uh, just a final word on the e-learning that we are happy that to, to date over 6,400 responders in Pennsylvania have, uh, have taken this training. And we've actually even seen out of state people who have taken it, uh, which is okay. It is the Pennsylvania version of the Federal Highway Sharp 2 training, uh, but it is very, very, uh, it's been blessed by uh, Paul Joden and, and Jim Ostrich and the team at, at Federal Highway. So if people from outside of Pennsylvania want to take it, they can take it too. Uh, yeah, exactly, Dave. Uh, and and that, that's a great point. So, you know, if you're involved in the transportation field, you know, this is a course that I think you could take. It's a three and a half to four hour course. You can take it online. You could start it and stop it as many times as you need to in order to finish it. So you don't have to sit there and do it all at one time. Uh, but I encourage you to take the, take the course. If you need the uh, material or how to access it, let us know, let Dave or myself know. We'll send you a copy of the flyer. We'll get you hooked up and you can take the course for free. This slide here shows a, a, what we get from Federal Highway about every two weeks, showing the number of responders that we have trained in, in Pennsylvania. So in 2016, we were at 11%. We're now up to 40.1%. So uh, we are constantly training. We have more uh, responders in Pennsylvania than many, many states. We're ranked sixth in the country for total number of people trained with a, close to 21,000 responders trained, uh, but that's not good enough. If only 40% of your team is trained in something, is, is that a good thing or do you need to train more? Uh, we feel we constantly need to train more. 
and, and we're out there as much as possible. We also offer this training uh, virtually. So if you want this training, uh, you know, go to the our Pentime website, pentime.org. There's a training page. You can see if there's a training class close to you uh, that we'll be doing virtually as well. So again, what we wanted to do with this training or what I hope to get out of this training session is to talk to you a little bit about what fire, EMS, towing, uh, DOT and some other agencies face when they go there uh, on, a, on a call. When I say go there, respond to an emergency on the roadway. Uh, what resources are available? Uh, if, you, if you haven't been involved in emergency services, how many firefighters, how many EMT, how many towers show up and, and when do they show up at the call? So that's what we wanted to try to explain to you uh, doing this session so that you have a little bit of understanding how fire and EMS uh, and, and responders work. Uh, we function a little bit differently from, at the Turnpike than from PennDOT, but we'll go over and explain that a little bit. Uh, my background, I was a volunteer firefighter since 1982. Uh, Dave is also was a volunteer firefighter. Uh, I was an EMT, a hazmat team member, a 911 operator. It sounds like you can't hold a job with all this stuff, uh, uh, but I, I can, you know, so. Tim Quarter, I've worked for the Turnpike for 21 years in the past five years as the Tim Coordinator for the Turnpike. So if you respond to an emergency, this is what we want you to think about. What do I have to do? Uh, what do I think about when I get when I hear that dispatch? How many times have we heard an accident where we 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 get a call that we're responding for an accident or you hear somebody say uh, there was an accident down there? Well, what was the accident? You know, what do you think about it? And, and if you're an emergency responder, uh, your your thoughts are different. OK. Is there somebody trapped in the car? Is there somebody injured? Is the car on fire? Can I get the door open? Do I have to do a door pop and just, you know, get the person out that way? Do I have to use the, we used to always hear them refer to everything as jaws of life, but there's all kinds of cutters and spreaders and those kind of things to get people out. Um, so what do I have to do? So that's something that as an emergency responder, when I get a call in my role at the turnpike, I'm thinking about, okay, what is it? What do I have to do? What's my scene size up? And understand what your priorities are, what, you know, from a transportation professional role, uh, we want uh, you want uh, the transportation people, the, the pen dots and the turnpike to alert you that there's an accident so they're not stuck in that backlog. So we use technology for that. We use things like Waze, Google Maps, those kind of things. Uh, what must the, you have for the incident and, and what are the deal breakers and, and uh, what can't you do? What uh, legally rules, regulations and, and legality. So where do you start at? Uh, since we don't really have a chat box, we can't really do this uh, like I was hoping to, uh, per se. But you know, how many of you have ever had to call 911 to an emergency? Uh, a lot of times when you call 911, and I was a, a uh, master trainer for, for 911 communications, you know, what are the questions that we ask? You know, uh, we want you to stay on the phone and, and stay calm. Uh, but at times we ask a lot of questions as a 911 person that you don't necessarily think like, why are they asking me all these questions? You know. Don't hang up, stay on the line. The dispatcher is gonna ask you a lot of questions and they're not gonna seem relevant to what you wanna do, but they need to get all your information and they wanna get your address and phone number. Uh, again, a tip for, tip for cell phones, disclose your city location immediately, let them know where you're at, describe your surroundings, specify what your emergency is and, and speak calmly and clearly. You know, We wanna make sure that we know how to get to you. Dave, you have something? Uh, I just wanted to throw in there, you know, when you put the calls to 911 through the lens of transportation, and this is something that we teach in the traffic incident management training, you know, bear in mind that, you know, and especially for people like us who are in the industry, you know, know the direction you're traveling, look for the nearest 10th mile post, you know, uh, don't rely necessarily on overhead signage, because you could say that you're at the exit for Oak Street, but that's actually, you know, 1.5 miles ahead. So, these are the kinds of things that we try to drive across in, in the TIM training. And so that's, I just want to throw that in, in terms of the information that you give out when you call 911. Yep, absolutely. So again, how to minimize the risk when you're out there on a roadway emergency, make sure the, the protocols are ahead of time, what your units are doing. Uh, many fire departments will send the address to, of the emergency uh, to where the extra unit is as a safety blocker. So if you see a lot of re emergency units responding, uh, they may send that second unit as, as a blocking unit now. We're trying to teach that. Again, we've only trained 40% of our people uh, on blocking, so you may see that piece of extra apparatus, the fire apparatus out there. Uh, some jurisdictions send uh, units in both directions on a divided highway. So now you not only impacted traffic directions in, in uh, eastbound lanes or the westbound lanes, you also impacted them the other 
uh, location as well. Uh, on the divided highway, how many times do you see, how many times do emergency responders make you run that gauntlet? Uh, so that we wanna watch as well. So when, we, when we're giving information out, and this, this is whether you're an emergency responder or you're not an emergency responder, you, you would talk about the communication si cycle, uh, transmit an idea from one, the mind of one to the other. So if you ever have to call 911 or you ever have to report an emergency, these are some of the things that we wanna do. You have the sender, the inf person give the information, the receiver, that's the 911 operator, What's your message and how are you giving that message to them? Uh, whether you're giving it to them as a text message, whether you're reporting it in ways or whether you're reporting it in a 911 and, and the feedback, make sure that they understand. Uh, we now get information through ways uh, at our uh, Turnpike Traffic Operations Center, sometimes four five, six minutes faster than a 911 call comes in. So uh, how's technology changing the way we handle a typical emergency? That's, that's one way. We're starting to look at Indrix and here data and roadway data uh, sensors to see if traffic's slowing down before we even get a report of an accident. So that's another way we look at that as well. So again, if you, if you contact the 911 center, you know, what are they gonna wanna know? They're gonna wanna dispatch the equipment out there to, to the, the emergency. And what's some of the challenges you as, as, a, uh, as the public or even as a transportation professional has when you're reporting a roadway emergency? Do you know the location? Do you see a mile marker? Are you familiar with the area or you're just passing by? Uh, do you see a landmark that you give? Uh, you know, if you're up in the New England state and you say, I see a Dunkin' Donut. Well, that might not be a good landmark since there, there's one in every corner uh, that you're at. Uh, you know, so make sure that you know what landmark to give them as well when you're, when you're doing that. Uh, we talked about radio communications and, and again, you know, here, uh, with this group, you, you don't have these, but we, we also want to make sure that when you're relaying information from one party to the other party, that message gets relayed properly. Uh, you ever play the game as a kid growing up where you whisper in somebody's ear and you, you pass it down the line, and by the time you get to the, the last person, the message completely changes? Well, that's what happens here. So think about you as a transportation professional, how we could uh, make sure that that communications is getting relayed properly and that communications that occurs even before the incident happens doing your transportation management plans doing this stuff that uh doing the uh the planning stage of a lot of these construction plans uh these incidents happen as well so let's look at uh, each specific uh specific discipline uh, a law enforcement officer how many people know when you go to the scene you know what the law enforcement officer is responsible for you know they secure the incident scene uh, they may provide some EMS care, some medical care before everybody else arrives. Uh, they uh, safeguard personal property, they investigate the crash, uh, but they also ha they have to help uh, people after the crash and assist in directing traffic. So again, this is what we want you to look at because you may not be familiar with what all they do. Uh, a lot of times for law enforcement, what happens is they're busy focused on the scene of the accident. So a roadway incident, they're, they're concerned about the two vehicles, three vehicles or whatever that are at the incident. But what about that backlog traffic? What about that trap queue? And, and as a transportation professional that has to deal with some of that, that may have to deal with that, especially if you're doing uh, a construction zone is, how do I mitigate or how do I minimize the impact of that backlog traffic? If, I'm, if uh, uh, some, some uh, traffic's going into the, the cattle chutes per se or, or something like that, how do I handle that? Dave, I'm gonna let you talk about fire and rescue because you, know, you have a background in fire and rescue too. So you know, some of the things that you do there. Yeah, sure. I mean, so, you know, fire, um, fire departments, uh, basically, I mean, incident scene protection, for sure. Uh, fire suppression, emergency medical care. I mean, you know, at least at the initial stages of a crash, you know, if, if, if fire is first on the scene, they're going to provide that initial care until EMS uh, arrives on scene. Also could be the incident commander, whether or not they retain that role uh, sort of is to be determined. A lot of times, you know, especially in Pennsylvania, uh, you know, state police will assume that role when they arrive on scene. But in other states, uh, Ohio, for, you know, for example, usually fire ends up being the incident commander and they, they stay uh, in that role. Again, initial hazmat response and containment. Hazmat units are much more specialized. They're also not quite as numerous as fire departments. Uh, so if you have a hazardous material situation, uh, you have uh, hazardous liquids impinging on drains or, or uh, you know, some other area that needs to be protected. Uh, the fire department is going to start those initial operations. And then, of course, you have your uh, rescuing and, and extrication of, of crash victims, whether it's from the vehicles, 
or from the you know potentially contaminated environment transportation for the injured and, and triage and then of course the overall incident clearance and of course assisting with traffic control until uh, law enforcement or dot can get there again fire departments uh, wear a lot of different hats at these scenes um, and, and it, when it comes to the traffic control issue specifically, since we're talking about a, a sort of a transportation specific uh, lens here, uh, that is definitely one of them, not one that they enjoy by any stretch of the imagination, unless they have a dedicated uh, fire police unit to, you know, to, to do that. But a lot of times that's not the case. So they have to do that initial scene setup and make sure that the scene is at least as secure as they can make it uh, for themselves and for the, the victims of the incident. Yeah, I think it's important to note, too, that many times that the, the person that you see along the side of the road helping the motorist is a volunteer. Uh, they're not always a paid uh, member. So that's somebody that's giving up their time with their family, their friends, uh, holidays uh, to go out there and, and serve the public. And they're a target on the roadway. So we got to protect them and we've got to do as much as possible to protect them as well. And let me just real quick, because we do have a comment in the chat box that, that led to a question from uh, Steve. Is it Grim or is it Grimmy? I'm not sure of the pronunciation, but uh, Steve indicated that he was on 80 eastbound uh, on a Saturday afternoon in probably in PennDOT area district two. He came over a, a slight vertical traveling with traffic about 70 miles per hour, and he was immediately confronted with some orange cones in the right lane. Um, and they were trying to push traffic over to the left. Um, the, the person working with the cones and trying to set it up was a, a, an older person uh, with a, a fire police unit. And the, the basic gist of this comment in question is that uh, we have a little bit of roadway geometry involved where they came you know, uh, over a roadway uh, where sight distances may not have been that great. And suddenly they were confronted by these, these cones and what is really tantamount to a temporary work zone. So that leads to his question of, you know, do we work with local volunteer groups like fire police to train them about proper emergency uh, setups? Uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, you know, we work with as many as we possibly can. Uh, obviously to do them on a one-by-one -one basis would be a Herculean task. So we try to do these things regionally as much as possible when we offer this training. But, you know, yes, we do. And, you know, fire police are prime candidates for this kind of thing, because, again, like he says at the end of his comment, this site seemed to be another accident waiting to happen, or as we call that, a secondary crash. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's very important. And, yeah, I mean, doing it wrong can sometimes be worse than not doing it at all. And I know that sounds a little bit strange, but especially in the areas where the roadway geometry is questionable and some of those site distances are compromised, doing it wrong can actually be worse. So that was probably a lot longer than it needed to be, but thank you for the question and comment, Steve. Yeah, that was a great uh, question because again, uh, a lot of times not every fire company has uh, fire police. Oftentimes these fire police are retired or are, fire, or are volunteers that can no longer fight fires. So they stick around and they're now a, a volunteer as a fire police officer. Uh, I would just hazard to guess with the fire police that I know, uh, the, the average age is probably 65, 70 years old. Uh, it, and, and again, too, you know, if I have to lift five cones at 70 years of age and I'm, I'm walking normally with a cane or, or some kind of a tool to walk, it, you know, am I able to do that? Am I able to be? Uh, but the challenge is, uh, like Dave said, there's no requirement. There's no physical requirement to be a fire police officer. There's nothing out there. Uh, we try to make sure that they're safe and working safe. Uh, they d dedicate hours and hours and hours of their time every week uh, to try to help others. And, and we don't have that volunteerism uh, in the fire service anymore uh, because people don't have the time uh, to do that. So that's a ch real challenge. So. Um, and let me let me just throw in also that there is guidance on this, and there has been a very serious push at the NFPA level with it's 1091, correct, Todd? Yep. Mm -hmm. So you know something like that is if you want to check out NFPA 1091, that is another resource that they can use, and that is specifically the the skills and the requirements of setting up you know a temporary traffic control at an incident scene. It took them forever for NFPA to get that out, but it is out on the street. I know Todd has taught it. Yep. So that resource is there. So remember NFPA 1091. 
Yep. And if you go to respondersafety.com, uh, it's a, a website. And, and again, all the training on there is free. Uh, we are now offering a course there on a traffic incident management uh, certification uh, with the uh, Fire Safety Officers Association and with the Emergency Responder Safety Institute. So this uh, that course is a written exam that you must take plus a practical exam. Uh, I would hazard a uh, guess that many, many responders won't take that because it is a, a fee to take that class. It is a written test and, and uh, uh, I help write the test so I know what's on the test and I have the answer sheet and I know it's not an easy test, but I want to make sure that if you're out there doing your job and you're getting certified, uh, you're gonna you're gonna pass the test. And yeah, I see Dave smiling because when we did the uh, online Tim course for, for Pennsylvania, uh, we wanted to make sure that you weren't able to cheat your way through the test. We wanted you to learn the material. So we wanted the answers to be randomized and have a, a uh, bank of randomized questions and answers because we didn't want you to cheat your way through the test. We want you to learn the material. Uh, so that's one of the things that we do. Um, yeah, you, you don't want one person logging what all the questions and answers are and then sharing it with a thousand of their closest friends on social media. That brings no benefit to anybody. Okay, we'll keep moving here just to, to get through here. We're talking about EMS, so your emergency medical services. Those are the ones that are gonna triage, treat, and transport the crash victims. Again, uh, they provide the advanced level of emergency care. Uh, talk about the determine where you're gonna transport somebody. What do you have to be concerned about now in a, in a accident world? Does that person have COVID? I mean, it's I, I know we get tired of hearing about COVID, but that's a concern if you're an EMS provider right now. What else is that person? Not, not only COVID, but what other disease do they have that I'm, that I'm treating here and how to protect myself. So we always teach universal precautions as an EMS provider. A lot of these photographs, I want you to take notice when we, we look at those photographs is, are the person, are the emergency responders wearing the high-vis safety apparel that they should? Uh, high-vis is in the MUTCD for roadway workers to be wearing a high-vis safety garment. Uh, so make sure that that you look at that when you're, when you're talking there as well. Uh, EMS, a lot of times they respond with two people uh, in the ambulance. So they're trying to do patient care plus watch their back from traffic uh, at an accident scene. So it, it creates a hazard for them as well. Total recovery. So these are a couple accident scenes here uh, that occurred. You know, they're responsible for clearing up all the debris on the roadway. They're often left by themselves. They're the number one or number two responder that gets struck in, and killed every year. Uh, there are 20 tow operators in the United States that were killed in uh, 2020 so far. In addition, there was two mobile mechanics. So those are the tire services that were killed. And there was three safety service patrol operators like the State Farm Safety Patrol operators that were killed in the United States. Again, these are United States numbers. In Pennsylvania, we've had 151 emergency responders killed all time along the side of the roadway, working on the side of the roadway, just trying to help somebody else out. Uh, you know, we want to use the towing recovery professionals and, and we're, they're starting to get specialized equipment where they don't have to block a lane and take a lane, but we're all about safe, quick clearance, getting the information and the incident off the roadway as quickly as possible. So that photo on the left-hand side, that was a, a uh, Toyota uh, Prius that slid underneath the uh, tractor trailer that was underneath it that had a mom and two toddlers that were trapped in there. Uh, that tow operator used his tow truck to lift that truck partially off that vehicle uh, in order to do the extrication to get the person out. The photo on the right was from January 5th of this year on the turnpike. That's the uh, fatal bus crash. Uh, that, that's the towers cleaning up that crash that we had where we had five fatalities at. Transportation agencies, Dave, I'm gonna throw this to you a little bit here because I want you to talk a little bit about what PennDOT does, uh, if you don't mind. And, and uh, now I'll talk about a little bit what turnpike does, or you could even talk about the turnpike as well. No, no. <laughs> Can't talk about the turnpike. It's all you. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, for the transportation agencies, uh, you know, obviously, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, the transportation management center concept, uh, obviously highly adopted here in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, with, with PennDOT, they have uh, different levels of transportation management centers. They either have uh, a district level TMC or they have a regional TMC, which is responsible for multiple districts. And of course, within the past several years, they rolled out their statewide uh, TMCs. But overall, I mean, they, uh, they, they, do you have next slides after this? 
to are there overlays on these images, Todd? Because you know the the overall responsibilities of the TMCs are at a high level is, is the monitoring of traffic conditions on the roadways yep. uh, by the use of closed circuit television cameras and uh, other technologies involving roadway sensors and uh, weather systems like RWIS, et cetera. They dispatch freeway safety patrols, as you can see that image at the bottom there. Uh, that's one of the, the Pennsylvania Turnpike vehicles to, to provide uh, motorist assistance on the roadway free of charge. And then, you know, this is the overall list. And again, I think most people are familiar with, with what the TMCs do, but it is a lot. Again, they wear many different hats in the overall traffic operations and incident management picture from the, the initial detection and verification of the incident, the, uh, the distribution and assignment of, of resources and liaison services with emergency communication centers, uh, and then of course, providing the traveler information through dynamic message signs and other, other services, and you know, up to and including now uh, things like Waze and, and in-vehicle uh, connected technology, getting information to to drivers that way, so that they can make better decision making about the routes that they're going to choose uh, on their their regular commutes. So that's you know at a high level, that is what the transportation agencies are responsible for. So Todd, uh, I don't want to take too much because I know you want to talk about what the the Turnpike TOC does, which is again a lot of the same, but the, the pictures are a little bit different. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about the Turnpike, Dave, and I don't know if you want to bring anything up about the hard shoulder running or the integrated corridor management uh, real briefly after I do that. Then. Sure. Uh, so uh, Turnpike works a little bit differently. Uh, we have a, a traffic operations center that functions as a 911 center. When we get a call in either from a county 911 center or star 11 from your cell phone, we dispatch emergency resources right away. We contract with 112 fire companies. 67 ambulances and 22 towers across the turnpike system. Uh, and we send the tow truck and we send those resources out right away. So when in doubt, uh, send them out. They get paid to respond. They get uh, fire companies, even if they're a volunteer company, get $225 to respond to that call for service on the turnpike so that we could uh, provide the best service possible to our customers on the roadway. Uh, they are our eyes and ears and, and we are all about quick clearance and getting on the scene as quickly as possible to get the roadway open. Uh, for our customers to prevent that secondary crash. So we're always looking to see what we could do um, to open up the roadway as quickly as possible. Uh, we have a communication system, a radio system, we're able to talk directly with all our communication responders. And we also have uh, Pennsylvania Troop T on the Turnpike is a Turnpike Troop and they're exclusively for the Turnpike uh, as well. So they're out there uh, helping motorists every day as well. Uh, Dave, you wanna talk a little bit about the yeah, so I mean, again, you know, at an engineering and safety conference, I think, you know, it's definitely worth a mention that within the realm of the transportation management center that, you know, there's always talk about next gen systems, next gen ATMS, next gen this, next gen that, uh, you know, the, the challenges that are confronting the TMCs these days is finding the next generation people uh, to operate all of these systems as things grow and technology grows and things get more complex. And Todd mentioned earlier, uh, you know, about say an integrated corridor management project where you can have any number of technologies deployed to manage congestion. You know, I, something like ICM is, is a, uh, a solution to avoid having to uh, widen roadways or build additional capacity. And mo you know, most places are at capacity in terms of what they can physically construct. So they're looking at different strategies in the use of technology through ICM to manage this congestion. So you can have gantries with lane use signals. We've got variable speed limits and you know any one of a number of different strategies, modifying signal timing, signal control. And you know these are not something that your, for lack of a better term, your old school operations folks are necessarily uh, this is not necessarily baked into them when they, when they come into their positions. So, you know, these are the things and the challenges and the advancements that the TMCs are making. And they're, you know, they're bringing their people along, uh, you know, with them. And as they hire new people, they're going to be looking for even more augmented skill sets out of those folks as, as they move ahead. So that's all I really wanted to offer on that. Yep. Thank you. Uh... Again, if you have any questions about anything that, that the Turnpike or PennDOT does, you know, we monitor traffic, uh, PennDOT, you know, and our TMCs, uh, our TOCs, you know, we, we monitor closed circuit television cameras, we monitor roadway sensors, 
uh, those kind of things. We put up DMS message signs. Uh, Turnpike did away with our uh, highway advisory radio systems. PennDOT still uses them in some locations as well, but we try to get the message out as quickly as possible. We use Waze, we use Twitter, uh, social media, you know, get the message out as, as much as possible. Uh, some of the things we also do is, is has that in cleanup teams. You know, we, we contract with spill teams across the turnpike. We have five separate spill teams that if something happens, a uh, diesel spill or some uh, hazardous materials, we could have that uh, team come out and clean up that spill. Uh, we also contract or will notify a local uh, county hazmat team. Each county has the, I think by uh, uh, state code or whatever, has a hazmat team that's assigned to them to uh, contain the spill, not necessarily clean it up, but they will contain it. They'll go out and mitigate the hazard and then they'll have somebody come out and do the cleanup uh, for that. So that's what they're responsible for accident scenes. So we often have to send them out to uh, emergencies on the roadway as well, especially when we deal with commercial vehicles. So where we're looking at too is a lot of people that come to the transportation uh, engineering safety conference may be planners instead of, of uh, engineers. So you know, we wanna make sure that people know uh, what the responsibilities are when you're when you're doing some of these plans uh, and also how we work with EMAs and emergency management agencies as well. Uh, highway incidents are rarely an emergency response unless we have to evacuate. So as a planner, if I have to know I have to evacuate a scene or if I'm doing something or I'm working on a, a traffic management plan for a large facility or, or a, uh, a construction project, where do I send people if something happens and, and what how do I handle that? If I'm doing a project where we're doing the uh, the turnpike, we did the accelerated bridge project where we closed the turnpike down for all weekend. How do I manage traffic and what do I do with my emergency resources? Something like that happens. Uh, so we want you to know those things as well. Uh, we want to make sure we have lists and contacts for people for activating resources if we need to send extra resources out there. Dave, do you want to talk about traveler information systems? Probably put you on the spot here. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, I, I'd be happy to, uh, you know, again, not, not at a, a super duper detailed level, but I mean, obviously, you know, traveler information comes in a lot of different flavors. Uh, you know, dynamic message signs are probably the, you know, the oldest of the lot at this point. But, you know, even they have evolved now when you look at these, these full color messages and, uh, you know, the use of graphics and color to, uh, to better illustrate things for, uh, people traveling at 65, 70 miles per hour who may not have time to read a lot of text and, you know, what you can do, a picture says a thousand words and what you can do with that, you know, can help eliminate multi-phase messages on, on DMS. But there's a lot of, of different ways uh, to, to skin a cat when it comes to, to traveler information. And of course, you know, we've moved forward in, in, in the recent years with, uh, you know, various applications like 501 PA, um, and of course, you know, the HAR, again, really sort of the, the dinosaur of the lot, I would say. So I guess really even in terms of uh, sunsetting, I would think HAR is probably the one that, that's closest to really going completely away, except for the most rural of areas. Uh, but, you know, the, the critical thing here, and like it says in the text there, and I'm certainly not going to read it all, but uh, this is all about decision making on the part of the driver and especially those who have not yet entered uh, the highway system uh, to make those decisions. So catching people on the arterials before they enter the interstate uh, to let them know that there's a problem um, you know, is critical. So there's a lot of applications out there and they're getting more complex all the time. You know, the 501 PA system has, uh, you know, morphed uh, again with, you know, the advent of things like uh, the 501 PA um, alert system, which is, you know, a, a geofencing system that can alert motorists that are stuck in a trapped queue behind a major incident of, you know, what's going on with the incident, expected time of the roadway, if they have any problems in their vehicle, if they need any sort of medical assistance or food or drink resources. And then, again, that's for the, the really super major uh, incidents going on. Uh, but, you know, running the gamut from broadcast partnerships with, you know, DOT, CCTV images on television or radio broadcast traffic reports to DMS to online applications, uh, it really does uh, run the gamut uh, when it comes to, to traveler information. Yeah, thanks, Dave. 
Uh, yeah, it, it's, you know, how can we get the word out? And this is how you could help us too. you know, what ways do we get the word out to the public? And how do we get that information? And how do we collect that data? How do we share that data? And what new ways can you think of to alert uh, our customers and our roadway users uh, when there is an incident so that they don't get stuck in the backlog? Nobody likes to be stuck in traffic. Um, we want to keep people moving as at all possible to avoid those secondary crashes as well. So, and, yeah, and I did, I did, I did misspeak. It's 501 PA connect. I, I said 501 PA alert, but it is 501 PA, uh, 501 connect. And, and yeah, that system did start in Pennsylvania. And I think we are, uh, we just had a meeting with Florida the other day that we talked with, uh, with them. And it's, I think it's in four or five states now. There's more states looking to do that uh, where we're geofencing. And I, and I could see that that's uh, going to become a, a, a big, uh, tool to alert not only for transportation emergencies, but for other emergencies that are out there as well. Uh, emergency response cycle, you know, some of these things, and again, all these work together and, and we need your help to do this as well. We have the emergency planning, training and exercise. We mount an effective response. We do the incident mitigation, uh, but we look at our business recovery processes. Uh, you know, I think back at some of the big incidents we've had on, on the turnpike here, you know, we had a Jonas blizzard, you know, so we had that response, we took care of everything, we came back in and what do we do? We had to have a, a large after action review because we had many, many things that we, we did a lot of things right, but we did a lot of things wrong uh, that we had to change our behavior. So you always constantly look and uh, we do after action reviews. And I have a little bit of uh, a section in here about after action reviews that we'll have Dave talk about because Dave helps us greatly with after action reviews and we change some processes because of that. And I'd like to talk about that as well. A couple of things that we do, you know, as part of my training, I was a, a, uh, a uh, master trainer in emergency communication. So these are some of the things I wanted to make sure we got across. You know, listen before you talk. How many times do we not do that? Uh, follow the conversation closely. Uh, some questions will be answered and, and gather critical incidents. And this even is for uh, part of the emergency. And my wife's home now, so I have to make sure that I tell her I listen to her. I critically think and, and not mess anything up uh, so she doesn't hurt me. Uh, but she doesn't hurt me, but uh, she probably doesn't hear me because she has TV on, but uh, listen for the communication for a while. If you start to uh, feel for the ebb and flow of the communication between parties, they become a, a better judge before you jump into something. And the last thing you want to do is barge in at an opportune moment uh, to either block or interrupt critical communication. So again, even if this is why you're in the planning stages of something like this, you know, follow some of these skills. Um, something here too, you know, uh, when we talk about getting on the radio, say if you ever had the opportunity to talk on the radio, you know, we, you get there and you hear this, um, uh, you know, and, and even for presentations, and I'm sure I'm saying uh, um, many times here, but uh, it's been a long day. It's been a long week. This is at least the third or fourth Wednesday of the week already. It seems like it, it's just never going to end. So uh, think about what's going, what you're going to say, how to say it, and, and before you keep the mic, and, and try to be as brief as possible, if at all possible, so that you could... Uh, uh, get your message out and get the point across. Again, uh, you, you've all heard this, uh, keep it simple, stupid. You know, I don't want to call anybody stupid, but that's that's the key. You know, make sure you're keeping it simple. Dave, did you want to say something? You're just trying to be brevity and you, you figure, look at that guy talk. I wish he'd shut up and go away. <laughs> I understand. Uh, take a breath, you know. Before you key the mic, take a deep breath. Uh, and before you talk in a room, yeah, take a deep breath, get it together. Um, you know, calmly, clearly get the message across, you know, uh, make sure that you're calm before you, you, you pick up too much stuff. Uh, we talk about this too. Make sure that's important before you say it. Don't just repeat something because you think somebody wants to hear it. Uh, know what priorities are and what can wait till later. Again, uh, information uh, triage, it's a continual process where we refine the information we gather, paying uh, most attention to the information that comes becomes valuable and identify it as, as we go. So how are you maintaining awareness? Some of the things that we do for situational awareness on the turnpike is, is we, we take photographs of incident scenes and we share those photographs of incident scenes and try to get them out there. Because again, a picture says a thousand words uh, sometimes and, and video is even better. So if you have a crash involving a, 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 uh, a truck, okay, is it a pickup truck? Is it a, a tanker? Is it a a box truck or what's what's the the box truck so we try to share that information and we try to share those messages out there and get that so we use some some data we use something 
uh, call it data capable to share some pictures and even something simple as Microsoft Teams now to share share video and and, and uh, photographs works well as well. Uh, we developed an app internally at the Turnpike. We call it the Star Mobile app. It's a situational awareness app. We're able to share photographs using the situational awareness app. We're also able to share a live instance while they happen. I could bring this up on my my phone here, and I could show you all the all the uh, instances that are occurring on the Turnpike right now. And when I click on one of those uh, boxes and, and it, uh, show you here, if I click on that incident, it will open up a map and show me the map and show me a field view of what that looks like at that scene there. And I have a better idea. It's not an actual live view of the incident. It's a, it's a Google field view, uh, but or a Esri field view, but you, you'll have that as well. Uh, live instance, it gives you a little bit of information about the incident. Again, it brings up a map, shows you pinpoints a location. Uh, and gives you the location this way. So hopefully you'll be able to see that screen. I know it's kind of small uh, for some areas. And it shows you, you know, the, the uh, travel condition map as well as we do this. Again, this is another view of this. It prioritizes the screen, shows us our CAD data from our computer to dispatch right in a TOC. Uh, every one of those instances you can click on and get some more detail about what's going on for that incident. Gives you a start time, end time, tells you what units you have on the scene, and allows you to put photographs right into the scene as well, or right into the incident so you can see what's going on. So no matter if you're somebody at the scene or if somebody sends you photographs, a lot of times what happens with my role working with responders, if we have an incident somewhere, somebody at the scene, the fire chief will text me photographs or send me photographs and I'll put them right in the incident so that we have them uh, and everybody that's involved in the incident can see what's going on. We also use mobile cameras. We like to have uh, mobile cameras out there on the roadway uh, so that everybody can see what's going on there. Um, let me go back here. Uh, again, 24-7 uh, pan, tilt, zoom. We have them in all the vehicles. The traffic operations center controls the camera. The person in the truck does not control any of the cameras there. We just want them to do worry about getting to the scene and, and work at a location where they could see something going on. Again, avoid redundancies, listen to what's going on at the scene, stop and listen, and uh, important details. When you arrive at the scene, if you ever have to call 911, this is some of the information we wanna know. You know, what number of the types of uh, vehicles involved, degree of damage, lanes closed, hazards. Uh, if you're just general John Q public, you're probably not gonna establish command, but if you're a responder, you know, you may wanna take charge of the scene and tell everybody what's going on. Always watch your back to make sure that you're not a target or a victim if you're stopped to help somebody on the roadway. Every year, uh, Good Samaritans get struck along the roadway, and, and we want to try to avoid that as well. Uh, hazards, you know, on scene hazards, look for wires down, lanes blocked, uh, you know, what you need to do, what, what can't you do. Going to go through here. Uh, on scene positioning and blocking. And, and what I want to show you is, and I'll have Dave talk to you next. Uh, slides is we had a, a fire company respond to the respond to a scene of an incident and the way they placed their cones uh, it created more of a hazard than it helped so Dave saw what was going on took a screenshot because we don't record our cameras and then he came up with a better way for them to do that so we use this as a teaching tool uh, so go ahead Dave if you want to talk through this we'll, we'll show you what happened here yeah, so basically, you know, we took a look at this. This is a still frame from one of the, the Turnpike's closed circuit television uh, cameras uh, where there was, you know, some definite issues with the way that this scene was set up. So, you know, basically as as part of uh, an after action, we were able to just do some some quick modifications to this to, to show them what not to do and uh, a better way to consider setting it up. Now, again, you know, you have to sort of be careful when you do things like this because, you know, when you get to volunteer fire departments, the key word is volunteer. Uh, and they are doing what they can often with limited manpower and limited resources. Not a lot of cones fit on one of those trucks. So we, you know, we approach this not so much from the, hey, you did this wrong, uh, but just some ideas of things you could do better. So re-angle your truck the, the right way and, you know, try to improve the way you have those cones tapered. Again, realizing that the amount of cones they have is going to be limited. Uh, but there are certain things that you can do to try and, and keep the scene a little bit safer for yourself. So this is a little bit crude uh, in terms of the graphics. So I guess there's only so much you can do with, uh, you know, the, the still frame of a CCTV. But we think that this uh, helped them understand a little bit 
of what the expectation is. And again, you set up what you can set up given the resources that you have on hand. And then when additional resources arrive, you supplement that and continue to iterate that process to make it safer and safer and safer as you go. It's not set it and forget it. It is set it and then improve upon it and improve upon it and improve upon it as more resources get on scene. Yeah, number of responders get hit in the first few minutes of arriving on the scene and the last few minutes as they're preparing to leave the scene because they let their guard down. So we want to make sure that we uh, maintain scene safety, which is what we're talking about here. How many times have you approached an emergency scene where the lights uh, uh, impact you? Uh, a lot of our responders think that too many lights are, are the more lights at the scene, the better. Well, if you're actually blinding somebody, uh, so even if you're a contractor out there working, Take time to look at the amount of lights you have there, especially if you're working at night. Make sure you're not blinding somebody and make sure you're not putting yourselves in harm's way and becoming a target. Uh, make sure your headlights too, you know, if, if you could reduce the amount of lighting at the scene and not create an additional hazard, uh, do that. But again, uh, don't just wait till you're at the scene to do that, you know, do some research beforehand. Uh, Respondersafety.com has a couple great modules on emergency vehicle lighting at, at an incident scene. So, you know, again, they're free. They're an hour long. Uh, if you want some more information, go there as well. Advanced warning, some traffic control devices. If you're ever out there working, make sure you have something that you're letting somebody know. Do I have the amber lights on my vehicle? How much amber lights do I have on there? Uh, am I using cones? Am I using flares? Am I using signs? What am I doing uh, for traffic control as well? Uh, make sure that you you have this and know what, what you can use and what you can't use and, and how to use them. Uh, I've stopped with some truck drivers uh, commercial vehicle drivers that didn't know how to put their triangles out behind their trucks doing a disabled vehicle. That's kind of scary. Uh, they're operating a truck with 50,000 pounds of, of uh, uh, a load and they, they can't figure out how to put out three triangles along the side of the roadway. Mercy vehicle uh, response areas, you know, make sure that you're seen at the scene. So if you're ever get out of your vehicle, don't take shortcuts to safety, you know, along the roadway. If you're supposed to wear the vest and hard hat out there, wear your vest and hard hat while you're out there. These are a couple examples here of, of responders, some with vests and, and some without vests. Who do you see better? The, the people with the vest you see uh, uh, better if possible. If you're supposed to have the hard hat on, wear the hard hat. Uh, there's a, additional uh, helmets that you get that, that provide some uh, better protection in case you would get hit uh, than, than a, a fall protection. You know, wear that if, if you can. Uh, set the example. Uh, which one of these guys is the fire chief? You know, this looks like the bad version of the village people. That's Dave Wolf there with the radio strap on. Uh, yeah, he he let his hair grow out after this, so that's why. Again, you know, I wonder why they didn't think I'm professional. Again, set the example, you know. Make sure you communicate. Make sure you talk. Make sure you have a, a plan at the scene. Uh, have a command post. And if you're involved in an incident or if you're involved in an after-action review, make sure you have those plans. Uh, planned out as well. Uh, use NIMS. If you haven't had NIMS training, it's the National Incident Management System training that's available online. Uh, it, it, it can help transportation professionals. You can take that training for free. If you take it for free online, take it seriously. Don't Google the answer and just say you got a certificate. It's not worth it. You know, make sure that you're you're working. We make sure that we have an incident commander at the scene and, and make sure that everybody's working uh, constantly so that we keep him informed. Uh, so that we all go home safely. Monitoring traffic control. Again, there's a lot of words on this screen, but basically adjust traffic control all the time when you're out there. Constantly look to see how you can make improvements and make the scene better. Uh, this case here too, when we talked about managing non-involved personnel, if you're not needed somewhere at a scene, if you stop to help somebody or if you're, or if you're there and you're not needed, leave. For the photo on the left-hand side, that was the the fatal accident investigation that we had earlier this year that had the five fatalities. When we arrived at the scene, there was about 40 firefighters that were standing around just watching the investigation. They weren't needed. So, you know, we sent them back to the station. You know, it was uh, 20 some degrees out there that day. It was uh, a light drizzle of rain and the road was freezing. So we, you know, we wanted to make sure they were safe and, and don't stick around the scene again. Photo of the area, you know, uh, trust and verify the information. Make sure that you get the details. So if you get information for, for, for an incident, especially in the transportation world, make sure you verify it with a reliable source, trust and verify before you go spreading that again as well. We always talk about uh, 
background noises if you're if you're broadcasting at at a work zone or an emergency scene make sure that they could hear you make sure you turn off uh everything that goes on there and show some respect and, and uh talk about dispatchers but show some respect to each other and also be a professional and be safe out there again we're going to talk about some uh instancing demobilization again we talked about the instancing as we tear down. So even if, if you're out there working a construction pattern or out there, this is the most dangerous time of the scene. Uh, so make sure you're staying safe. These are some examples of some emergency equipment that got hit. Uh, the fire company on the right hand side is Irving, Texas. Uh, they now have a blocker vehicle in place. Uh, so they take an old piece of fire apparatus and use it as a blocking vehicle. Unfortunately, two days ago, a, a vehicle came down the interstate the wrong direction and, and sit hit and seriously injured one of their firefighters. Uh, so always watch your back. Dave, you wanna talk a little bit about after action reviews quick and then we'll finish up. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, you know, after action reviews are something that are sort of a necessary component of any incident, especially the major ones. Uh, you know, normally uh, they get misconstrued as a blame session. That's really not what they are. They're there to just really evaluate uh, what occurred and what could potentially be improved in the future, but at the same time also identify what went well, identify the best practices. Uh, anyway, and it's important to keep in mind the difference between a hot wash and an after action review. You know, hot washes normally occur literally while you're still at the scene uh, and everything is completely fresh in everyone's memory. After actions usually take place uh, sometime after, although not terribly long after. But when it comes to after action reviews, you know, what we've adopted to work with uh, you know, especially within the Turnpike Commission is a structured process uh, that involves, you know, a pre-survey that goes out to all of the attendees uh, to identify some key areas of discussion so that a, a true agenda can be developed. It's not just everybody get in the room and start talking at one another. No, it's, you know, it's an agenda uh, based on the, the things identified by the people who are actually there. And then, you know, once that after action review is, is completed, the key focus is to identify a minimum of one actionable item, no matter how small or simple it may be, but one actionable item that can be uh, addressed and implemented because they need to have value. They can't just be a perfunctory exercise of, well, we all talked about it uh, and so we did our job. I mean, and then you go out and you make the same mistakes the next time. It, it's got to be better than that. And, and, you know, through Todd's guidance, we've really elevated the game with after action reviews and we, we take those actionable items and then we actually implement them to demonstrate effective change. So that's, that's it at a quick level to, cause I know we're running short on time. Yeah, I, I'm actually, I think this is gonna be probably one of the last screens we talk about. Uh, just to uh, make mention to the incident there on the left-hand side, uh, that was a fatal accident that we had. A doctor tried to get to the scene. He wasn't able to get, because he didn't know what gate he was at. We thought he was saying he was at Pool House Road. He was at Schoolhouse Road. So if you travel the turnpike uh, since then, after we after the actual after action review, one of the things we said is we need to mark our access gate. So that's why the blue signs, the blue and white signs are on the access gates. So again, you do make changes when you talk about this. We never marked our gates because we knew where our gates were, but our mutual aid companies didn't. Uh, the photo on the right is that is that where the Toyota Prius went underneath that truck. We did that after action review because everything went well for that. Up until the time we started talking to them uh, at the fire company afterwards, and we learned that uh, 30 minutes into the incident, they started smelling sulfur, they started smelling chemicals on a truck hauling very bad chemicals. And we asked them if they stopped and, and, and uh, made the scene safe for themselves. And it's like, no, we wanted to get the people out. Uh, so we talked about how to work safely and how to do some uh, advanced uh, uh, procedures and, and uh, you know, change that process the way we do things. So. All right, here's the uh, our contact information. Thank you for taking the time to uh, listen. Hopefully this was informative and you learned a little bit of something. Uh, I want to thank Dave Wolf for uh, taking the time to present this with me. Again, we wanted to try to give everybody a little bit of an idea of, of what the emergency responder faced at the scene and, and appreciate your time. Thanks, Todd. Take care, everyone. Yep, thanks.